Well, good to see you all coming in and welcome to CG's uh, 218th seminar since the foundation of the center at the end of 2015. And it's about our 88th, I think, in the webinar format, which we've been running since April last year, when just after the pandemic began. And today we're back on our favorite topic, the new geopolitics of international higher education. This title in one way or another applies to about 30 or 40 of our webinars in the series, um, but we've got a really good uh, uh, group today to take us through it uh, and to add some new insights, I think, to that discussion. Before I introduce our panel, I'm going to run you through the webinar protocols. Some of you will have heard this before. Um, now the webinar is being recorded. It goes onto YouTube within about 48 hours and you can reach it through our website. Um, and uh, a transcript of the chat function is also posted on our website. So all your words, whether written or spoken, will be recorded for all time, or at least as long as all these electronic systems last. Um, now, please keep yourself muted during the webinar. It's uh, good if we can eliminate the possibility of background noise, uh, doorbells ringing, dogs barking, and, uh, and, and things happening in, uh, immediately around you. Um, and also, you. I think you can leave your uh, video off as well uh, during the um, webinar, but please turn them both on when you come into the discussion during the Q&A. We recommend using the speaker view um, setting in Zoom in the top right corner there, so you can more clearly see who is talking at any given time. Now to ask a question, and we really encourage you to think of quest curly and otherwise questions for our panel, um, this is what makes our webinars interesting, I think, uh, particularly interesting is that we have an engagement between the speakers and the audience and the participants. Um, to ask a question, use the chat function. Uh, you type out your question uh, into the chat and then I will see what's there and select the Q&A from the chair accordingly. Uh, generally speaking, if you're uh, relevant to the topic of the webinar, not all things said in the chat are, but if your, your comment is, or your question is, uh, and you come in early, we'll bring you into the Q&A. If you come in five minutes before the end, there's no guarantee because we usually have a fairly full list of Q&A by that stage. So think think quickly, think on your feet, think early and come in with your, your question in the chat. Now, when you're actually invited to ask your question, and I will give you a warning in the chat usually before bringing you in, um, if you, when you're invited, please unmute yourself, turn on your video, and then when you come in, state your name and where you are from, and then give us your question or your statement. Now, it's a pleasure to introduce the panel, and I'll introduce everyone at the start, because I think this is a bit easier, and that will allow the speakers then to pass the, the speaking role to each other. First, we have Emma uh, Zaliva, who, sp who spoke previously in our webinar series, in a very well attended webinar, which looked at Central Asia, post-Soviet zone. Emma is a senior policy analyst at UNESCO's International Institute for Higher Education and a research associate at York University in Canada. She's looking at futures of higher education, post-pandemic student uh, mobility and the geopolitics, the topic of today, geopolitics of higher education and the international higher education immigration nexus, a very interesting topic and very much in the melting pot at the moment. Our second speaker will be Lisa Brunner. She's a PhD candidate in educational studies and a regulated Canadian immigration consultant. She currently studies the intersection of mobility and education. And previously she researched refugee settlement experiences in Canada and the US. And our third speaker is Adam Grimm. He's a scholar practitioner who um, it says here in the um, in the in, in the bio, Adam, who how the cross border mobility and relevant policies at the institutional and national level. So I think some words have gone missing there. Explore those things. <laughs> ah, right. Yes, indeed. Um, utilizing primarily qualitative research methods, which most most of us do. Um, he explores these stories and experiences of individuals as related to their transnational positionalities to learn how their worlds spanning borders are socially constructed in undefined and contested spaces. Very interesting. 
the intersection between identity agency and circumstances, conditions, mobility, changes of perspective and multiple imaginings. Um, where again, many of us are interested in that kind of work and we really welcome those insights into mobility, migration, higher education uh, and where we're going with all those things in the pandemic context. Um, so it's a pleasure to hand over to Emma at this point. Thanks very much, Simon. I will put my screen share on. Okay, so we have three of us. We're all going to aim for about 10 minutes um, and that should give us sufficient time for questions and answers later on. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of myself and, Ma and Hannah Moskowitz at the University of Cambridge on some joint work that we're doing with this very exciting title. Thanks so much for joining us today. Let's get moving on. Um, so we, like many of you, I'm sure Hannah and I have been working on issues related to the politics of higher education, international higher education, geopolitics for some time now, coming at this from slightly different perspectives. At the same time, again, like many of you, we've been watching events around the world unfolding, particularly in recent years, and reflecting on the impact of these events on higher education, but also thinking about higher education's role in impacting those events. La at some point last year, we decided to join forces and um, co-edit a special issue on the topic of the new geopolitics of international higher education. That's coming out in the journal Globalization Societies and Education early next year. Um, it really seems to have hit a nerve. We had a really outstanding response to the call for proposals. We're hoping to have around 10 articles uh, in the special issue covering a whole range of different topics. And as those of you who've been involved with special issues or read them before know, you know, it's a really excellent opportunity to bring together people who think about these issues from different geographical perspectives, different epistemological perspectives. And just on the screen here, I've, I've put some of the various different factors that are taken up across the articles. The bottom line, what we're trying to do with the special issue is root the study of international higher education in prevailing geopolitical currents. So in my short presentation, I just want to say a little bit about how Hannah and I are thinking our emerging work on the definitional side, on the foundational framing of this topic for the special issue. So I mentioned that we've been tracking kind of events in global politics, uh, shifting global politics and rising global challenges. Um, and here's how we have been defining and thinking about them. So we have weaknesses in global governance. There are mounting backlashes to multilateralism and free trade. We're seeing a resurgence of political populism, nationalism and authoritarianism. The balance of global power has been swinging towards China. We could even think about Asia more generally. There are climate related emergencies and there are growing demands for reparative social justice. All of these issues have been whirling around at slightly different tempos in different places at different points in time. But then we get to 2020, which we are thinking of as this sort of watershed moment for global politics. Uh, there's COVID bursting the balloon and bringing up to the surface many of these issues which have been bubbling away underneath. And for those of us um, who are studying kind of educational inequality, for example, we also know that COVID is really shining a light on many of the inequalities and inequities that already existed before, but which have now suddenly come to light. Okay, so that kind of gives you the background on the political side, but what's the connection here with higher education? What I want to do now is give you uh, two very brief examples, um, which you may or may be uh, more or less familiar with, so happy to discuss more later on but simply to give a very brief insight into how this plays out on the higher education scene. We were preparing this presentation a couple of weeks ago, and both of these events happened within 24 hours of each other. So I think it really helps us to see the prescience of the issues that we're talking about. So first, we're gonna to go to Hungary, where on June the 5th, as you can see from the newspaper, or the uh, online newspaper headline here, there was a very large protest somehow working their way around local COVID regulations to ensure these people could come together. Um, and that was against the plans of Fudan University to build a campus in Budapest, the capital of Hungary. These plans have been in the works for a while, but have seemed to have come to a head um, and as portrayed through the protests here for two reasons. One, the site of the China, uh, the Fudan campus was going to be on a site that had been previously set around, set aside for student housing. Um, and second, because it 
became known that Hungarian taxpayers would be footing the bill for the construction of the campus, which valued at around US $1.7 billion, was more than the Hungarian government currently spends on its 24 public universities for, for comparison. So this has led one local journalist to say, and I quote, while generally uninterested in foreign affairs, the consummate China ally in Central Europe is suddenly debating China, debt trap diplomacy, and the brand of Marxist ideology taught at Chinese universities, end quote. So what we see coming up here is a really interesting combination of, kind of domestic concerns, coupled with some of these swirling geopolitical currents that we've mentioned here. So we have in Hungary, Viktor Orban, a prime minister who's a populist, has been getting closer to illiberal leaders in China who um, have been supporting the branch campus here. But these protests aren't anti-West protests, which is often what we've been hearing. The previous news from Hungary uh, would lead us to think that. But these protests are sort of anti-China and sort of pro-national higher education development at the same time. So thinking back to those kind of list of challenges that we mentioned here, we've got the sort of political shifts. We've also got fears around, um, you know, growth, growth and influence in China. But this is a sort of strangely pro and anti-China all at the same time. So that's example number one. Example number two is a little bit closer to me here uh, in Toronto in Canada. So this is June the 5th in Hungary. Then we go the next day to June the 6th um, in Toronto with a statue here of Egerton Ryerson toppled uh, following a peaceful protest and march, uh, which had been called to commemorate uh, the recent discovery. And this is um, extremely upsetting. Um, the recent discovery of the remains of 215 children at a so-called residential school in, in Western Canada in late May. Um, what's the connection between that and the, uh, the chap who's lying on the floor here? Well, Ryerson um, is known as one of the architects of this residential school system. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, there's a lot to say. I will say simply briefly that this is a system that forcibly removed indigenous children in the name of so-called assimilation and did so right the way through until 1996 when the last school closed. This, this, these were acts of genocide. Ryerson's role in that also comes to play in the site of higher education because there's a university in Toronto that has been named after him. So again, what we're seeing here is a coming together of more domestic issues with globally circulating ideas, with trends that we've seen in other places, with the statues coming down, with social justice movements calling for this kind of change. And here we have a local journalist wrote, writing recently, and I quote, last summer's protests, so last summer is referring to 2020, last summer's protests for black lives fundamentally shifted public opinion on how historical figures linked to colonialism and racism are commemorated in public spaces. So here, again, we've got just like in the Hungary case, although a different set of concerns, the coming together of geopolitical shifts, local concerns, and these are playing out in this case, physically on the site of higher education. So in the special issue, there are many other different sort of examples of particular events that have come together, like the two vignettes that I've given here, but there are also others where perhaps there aren't these kind of definable moments, but rather what you have is kind of a build up um, of, of, and connection of, of different things, um, which are leading to what we're calling the new geopolitics. So I think these two examples also help to indicate how we're looking um, at this in a kind of empirical and theoretical way. We think, um, that in order to understand the new geopolitics of international higher education, you have to look across scales and you have to look across actors. This won't be new to those of you who study higher education and anybody who's read um, Simon's work with Gary Rhodes on the glow Nakal framework will look at the scales and say, yes, that looks familiar. It's important to see these different um, forces coming together, sometimes simultaneously when we're talking about higher education politics and processes. Here, I think what we're simply trying to highlight is that it's not only the scales, but it's the actors. Um, and I'll just briefly mention the enablers as well. I also want to say on the actors and the dynamics of those coming together, this isn't about saying, well, you know, let's pick one actor group from that bubble and one and scale from that bubble. No, this is about kind of intermeshing and interweaving. It's about different scales, different actors coming together at the same time or in parallel with one another. Um, and the actors that we've put here, you know, those will be fairly typical and, and known to you. So thinking about students, 
higher education institutions, states, international or regional organizations. But in article, in the other articles, there are other actor groups that perhaps we don't necessarily think of as being players in this geopolitical game. So the role of um, an ethnic diaspora group comes up, for example, in one of the articles. And this third bubble here of enablers, which is something that we're kind of working on at the moment, so would appreciate, you know, particularly any ideas or, or feedback that you have on that. These are about the kind of facilitating forces which help these geopolitical shifts or changes to take place and to work through in higher education. They are typically, I think, transnational. So um, when we're thinking about globally circulating ideas or social media, for example, um, I think that would make sense. But they also work underneath the level of the nation state. And then in the case here of regulation, that would be more typically found at that state level. And presumably these enablers could also work as disablers. They might prevent certain things from happening or, or, or channel them in a particular direction. Um, I think I'm probably coming to the end of my time. So I'm just going to finish with one final slide on... This is sort of how we're kind of taking the empirical side and on the theoretical side, thus far in our work, Hannah and I see particular value in investigating these international higher education policies and practices from a broadly critical geopolitics lens. Now, that's a lens that's been around since the late 1980s. It's taken many directions since then, as theory does and should, um, although as um, a recent article by Nguyen has noticed that it really has been surprisingly absent in studies of education so at school level and at higher education level, despite our you know, growing understanding that it's not just about how geopolitics shapes education, but it goes in the other direction. It's about the role of education in shaping geopolitics. There are sort of within the broader uh, school of thought of critical geopolitics, there are just three things, uh, three final points to make here about why we think this might be a compelling way to, to move forward um, in our work. So, you know, typically critical geopolitics is concerned with challenging assumptions about territory. So breaking what Agnew has called the territorial trap. And the issue we have the territorial trap is it basically fixes the nation state as our only kind of object of analysis or scale that we can use. So we want to try and break that with this work. That's one sort of area here. The second is to use um, typically found in geopolitics of knowledge. So work by Walter Mignolo and by people who are kind of connected or, or inspired by that kind of body of work. And that helps us to move beyond the kind of Western hegemonic conception of geopolitics, as Mignolo has said, changing the terms of the conversation. And finally, taking insights from feminist geopolitics and urban geopolitics enables us to scale both down to a micro level to understand everyday practices and lived experiences, but it also enables us to scale up again at a kind of beyond the nation state. So at a transnational level to look at power relations beyond that or above the nation state. So that's us for now. Uh, we look forward to your questions later. I shall stop sharing so we can hand over to Lisa, but thank you very much. Hello, so yes, thank you so much, Emma. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. I'm, I'm so grateful to be here. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of British Columbia, uh, which is on the um, traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from that territory and for that I'm grateful. I've also worked as an international student advisor for the university since 2012 which informs this talk about higher education surveillance of international students. Uh, so my research looks at how higher education is becoming increasingly entangled with immigration driven by two trends. So this is the reliance on international student generated revenue. And secondly, a global race for highly skilled immigrants. And this is particularly clear in Canada where higher ed now plays a significant de facto role in the selection and settlement of migrants. But less examined in Canada is higher ed's involvement in its state international student compliance regime, which is basically the collection and reporting of international student data to governments, such as one's enrollment status or classroom attendance. And as many of you may know, this reporting is now mandatory in many top international student recruiting countries. And it raises questions about higher ed social responsibility, complicity, and culpability in migration, surveillance, and enforcement. <clears throat> 
So in the paper that this talk is based on, I analyzed policy documents to trace the formation of Canada's reporting system. And I also argue that this involvement is not a novel compromise of higher ed's values, as it has been argued elsewhere, but rather connected to historical patterns of higher ed's involvement in state and border imperialism. So there's two interrelated areas of scholarship that underpin this research. The first responds to the increasing presence of borders in everyday life, which have moved beyond the state's physical edge to include bordering that occurs before one enters the state. Uh, so for example, reducing asylum claims by preventing would-be refugees from entering one's territory. And secondly, gatekeeping within the state. So this is often supported by non-state actors such as airlines or employers. So it's become less useful to consider borders from a territorialist Western geopolitical imagination, uh, but instead we can see borders as dynamic practices. And these bordering practices are tied up in border imperialism's larger re uh, regimes of institutions, and discourses and systems, which basically entrench controls against migrants and determine whom the state includes. The second area of scholarship is surveillance. And like borders, surveillance is also a set of practices that saturate everyday life at this point. And surveillance is not inherently problematic. So lifeguards, for example, are useful, most people would say. But the concern here is surveillance's impact on individuals' life chances through social sorting, which refers to the selection processes which classify and categorize people. And both surveillance and borders have long impacted indigenous and racialized people unevenly in the service of white supremacy, empire, state, settler colonial state, for example. Um, but specifically the modern exclusionary power to sort foreign nationals as desirable or undesirable became especially visible in anti-terrorism politics following 9-11. And then again, we see it today quite starkly in the COVID-19 pandemic. So the resulting safety state in which individuals and borders and biometrics are more closely linked results in a larger um, data-driven future-oriented analysis in which anticipatory surveillance is seen as essential for the early detection and prevention of crime. And to do this, it requires a collection of huge amounts of data which become a kind of mass social sorting. And the challenge is that it's increasingly opaque to the public um, which leaves the data collectors, in this case, higher ed institutions, largely unaccountable. So higher ed has historically also been an actor in these areas alongside the state. So many people may still overlook the ways in which, for example, slavery, colonialism shaped higher education, but it does have roots in these systems of differentiation and control which persist today. And surveillance is similarly integral to education for example, through data collection, assessment and evaluation, but also through a history of state spying and recruitment. And again, these impacts have been and continue to be unevenly distributed. Um, the key thing I want to highlight is that both of these practices are really naturalized within higher ed institutions. So I now zoom into higher ed's involvement in international student compliance regimes specifically. So there's some limited research on the topic in the context of the US, the UK and Australia. And each of these regimes has its own context. Um, but I see five key yet often subtle common characteristics. So first of all, they're more than just databases. These are governing tools and yet they're inflexible. They're often technically flawed and glitchy and it has really significant consequences often for students. Secondly, they impose structural institutional changes. So for example, they, they participate in that process of transferring power from classrooms to administrative offices. They transform the role of higher ed, making institutions a disciplinary apparatus in new ways. They transform the subjectivity of higher ed staff and faculty um, who may shift from advocates and figures of support, which is how international student advisors might have viewed themselves to extensions of the government and what have been called de facto border guards. And they also refashion student subjectivities. So they really stress the differences between domestic and international students. Um, the latter whose legal status is always already provisional, contingent and revocable. Now notably absent from analysis is Canada, 
which is a country second only to Australia in its proportion of international students at this point, and third in total number. Canada is known internationally for its welcoming policies, I would say, towards international students, but this perceived benevolence is being questioned and it warrants more nuanced attention. Um, so very briefly for context in Canada, student per study permit holders nearly tripled in the past decade. And like many countries, international students are positioned as economically important. But unlike many countries at this point, international students are also really aggressively recruited as potential immigrants. Although post-graduation labor market success remains elusive for many international graduates and permanent residency is far from guaranteed. Um, and despite Canada's reliance on international students, they're still simultaneously seen as threats, especially as potentially disingenuous students. So the Canadian government works to curtail the spread of schools catering to economic migrants in disguise. So Canada's international student surveillance system evolved not only as a security tool, but also as a social sorting tool to separate desirable, economically beneficial students from less desirable, economically, economically risky, low wage workers. So very quickly, how it works in Canada, as of 2014, Canadian Designated Learning Institutions, or DLIs, submit enrollment snapshots of international students based on the options here twice a year. And Canadian schools are not required to proactively monitor attendance or submit immediate updates when an enrollment status changes. So it's thus not as visible as many of the other surveillance systems in other countries. And the government does state in policy documents that it learned from other countries' experiences and took a relatively light touch approach in hopes of avoiding, quote, future overcorrection. So Canada's system is arguably subtler than those in other countries. And as a bordering practice, it functions almost imperceivably. Students are generally informed if, when, or what data is reported. Yet these are, <clears throat> these are precisely the everyday practices which normalize, naturalize, and depoliticize border imperialism. Students by extension of their data unknowingly encounter the border in removed yet really regular ways. Um, there's also little evidence of public resistance in Canada. So this, you could argue this is due to unawareness, but it may also reflect a surveillance culture in which we're not only familiar with surveillance, but acknowledge that expecting privacy may simply be moot. Students may not know they're being reported, but they may expect that they are. And finally, while higher ed is technically serving the needs of the state in new ways, it has always surveilled and it has always served the imperialist needs of the state. The research on this topic tends to portray higher ed is good and immigration regimes is bad, but this forecloses the possibility that international education is not premised on a climate of hospitality to begin with. Um, I'm trying to argue that the, the control of non-citizen students is embedded in a much deeper logic and we have to avoid exceptionalizing the present. So in conclusion, I draw on this phrase after surveillance to gesture towards like an interrogation into the role of surveillance in higher ed, as well as strategies to interrupt its effects. And this would require a willingness to speculate that some of the surveillance roles we have come to accept could be otherwise. And if we take this argument further, for example, drawing from black radical and indigenous scholar considerations of refusal, as an alternative to inclusion or resistance, we might consider refusing to acknowledge the academy, disinvesting from higher education entirely, or looking beyond the state. I'm not sure what the answer is, but unless we do so, we, those of us who work in higher ed must also sit with questions of our own responsibility, complicity, and culpability as we ourselves participate in institutional surveillance and border imperialism. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would deeply appreciate any feedback you may have as a PhD candidate, um, but for now, I will pass things over to Adam. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon to others in other hemispheres. I know it's super early for Lisa there, so thanks. Thank you for joining. It was great to hear everyone's presentation. Um, I'm excited to present today uh, on behalf of my friend, colleague, and mentor, Riyadh Shah Jahan, who is join, uh, joining in the audience today. 
Um, we came to, to this work through conversations stemming from other collaborative projects regarding global higher education and through reflections on our own global higher education mobility journeys. In this presentation, I wanna walk you through some of our conceptual thinking as we grapple with observations of global higher education and particularly the role of the nation state in shaping how global higher education is imagined, enacted and experienced. We sincerely appreciate the opportunity to be included in today's discussion and look forward to what I'm sure will be a wonderful conversation at the end. I already have lots of questions and I'm ready to engage. Um, Malaysia is not a place for doing a PhD. It's a place for going on vacation with your wife and children. India will restore its role as a Vishwa guru, welcoming and supporting students arriving from abroad. India has reached a pivotal juncture. It is ambitious and has undoubtedly the potential to emerge as a key player in global higher education in the coming years. In these three snippets, we can see a taste of how the nation state carries with it powerfully evocative affective weight. With these narrations of global higher education, the nation state comes into being as it is felt through the imagined and experienced encounters among actors in global higher education. We will explore more deeply these examples later in the presentation. Next, I'm gonna walk you through how we've been grappling with these ideas conceptually, as well as how we've been thinking about situating these conversations within the broader higher education globalization discourse. This paper builds on the work of Dr. Shah Jahan and Adriana Kazar, where they critiqued the field of higher education for clinging to the national container, extending the methodological nationalism critique that has been levied elsewhere in the social sciences. Methodological nationalism is the assumption that the nation state is the national cate natural category of analysis for society. Uh, it, it is defined by national boundaries. We hope to explore the affective ontological underpinnings of methodological nationalism pervasive in global higher education in this presentation and in this conceptual work. In doing so, we hope to add to the critical literature of globalization by examining the emotional or affective elements of global higher education that have been underexplored. Here, we must acknowledge an array of excellent scholars from across the globe who have, who's, who have influenced our thinking on this topic. Specifically, in this conceptual paper, we utilize affect theory to explore the nation state category and how it comes into being or becomes sticky as we're calling it through the experienced and imagined encounters among individuals, a Bengali, a Bengali professor in this, set, in, this, in this study, national policy actors um, and, and transnational actors such as commercial rankers. We use the term affect to mean emotions, responses, reactions, and feelings that are relational and transpersonal. Affects emerge from the interactions between bodies, whether those be individuals or collective, and are therefore always social in nature. Furthermore, we emphasize the becoming properties of affect. Affect brings objects into being by making them sticky with emotions through an encounter with other objects. For example, na national actors or individual anxieties and aspirations. Ahmed argued that affect ontologizes a subject, for example, domestic students or internationals, by creating a common surface around that subject while responding to an object, in this case, the nation state. The nation state acts like Velcro to attach itself with various forms of affect, but given it's also a shared object of affect, it also binds together collectives who react, respond, and are evoked by that object albeit with various types of emotions. Inspired by notions of aerography and wet ontology, we go beyond the nation state as simply a spatial signifier, but an object that is sticky with affect. Plus Stevens' notions of aerography remind us that the national feelings cannot be traced back to a, sever a single sovereign source, but rather emanate from multiple constituencies as part of a nebulous diffuse atmosphere. Relatedly, Sutherland's notions of the politics of longing ground us in wet ontologies. This helps us to transcend the ethno-national ethno categorizations and step outside taken for granted dichotomies of self and other, nationalism and cosmopolitanism, majority and minority, and understand that national belonging has ebbs and flows in many directions, and those are unconstrained by conventional understandings of national time and space. 
Like aerographies, the notion of wet ontologies and the politics of longing allows us to reconsider how our affect plays a role in bringing the nation state into being through the imagined and experienced mobilities and connections of actors in global higher education. In exploring how the nation state is brought into being by affect, we first visit the mobility narratives of Borhan, a pseudonym, who is a full professor of the social sciences in a public university in Bangladesh. His story reveals how the direction of his global mobility through higher education was determined by considerations of the worthiness of study de de destinations along nation state lines. Borhan first shared with us what he told his Danish supervisor when asked why he decided to do a, a PhD abroad. I told him that in a sense, this was actually a fashion. It's a fashion in the sense that if I do my PhD from abroad and write in my visiting card that I did my PhD from blah, blah university, I'd be considered very knowledgeable and brilliant. Yet Borhan informed us going abroad is not enough. The worthiness of potential destinations is determined along nation state lines. He shared from a conversation with his undergraduate supervisor as he was planning for and applying for graduate studies. So when I went to him and told him about the two scholarships and that they were for PhD, not masters, he asked me where. I still remember the day. He first saw the offer letter from Malaysia it was in a new field then. I didn't think about the priority, the hierarchy, or the ranking. He just took the letter and threw it away. Told me, Malaysia is not a place for doing a PhD. It's a place for going on vacation with your wife and, wife and children. Not one professor let us write to any university in Japan. Instead, they told us to do our PhD in Western Europe, but not in Asia. Next, we share from the policy documents for a proposed Indian higher education reform to demonstrate how such documents affectively, affectively render India as a personified spatial container with affective sensibilities, such as anxieties about fallen, falling behind or aspirations for self-actualization or realizing its potential. Let's consider a couple of examples. India will be promoted as a global study destination, providing premium education at affordable costs, thereby helping to restore its role as a Vishwa guru. An international student's office at each institution housing foreign students will be set up to coordinate all matters related to welcoming and supporting students from abroad. Let's consider another example. Courses and programs in sub subjects such as Indiology, Indian language, etc., but also internationally relevant curricula. In these snippets from the policy document, the discourse frames India in such a way that India or Indian higher ed becomes the container to welcome the international other whether those be international persons or ideas from outside India. And also India becomes the home that might nurture the things, the persons or ideas that are innately Indian. We argue that effective framing of the state imposes the, nation, the, the notion of the nation state uh, on, on would-be global encounters and mobilities and co connections in higher education, thereby shaping what global higher education can and might be. Finally, we draw from commercial university rankers staff quotes within, within Indian national news media to demonstrate how these commercial actors position India for, as the taken for granted a container. I'll share briefly from one quote. India has reached a pivotal juncture. It is ambitious and has undoubtedly the, the potential to emerge as a key player in global higher ed. The government institutions uh, eminence initiative could certainly elevate selected universities on the global stage and may begin to narrow down the gulf with China in this ranking. But sustained investment, a relentless drive to attack, attract leading global talent and a reinforced emphasis on international benchmarking will be cr crucial to realizing its global ambitions. In these and other quotes in the Indian national media, rankers personify the nation state with affective sensibilities whereby the potential for advancing or avoiding falling behind with India's higher education might be realized. Although rankers purport to provide an unbiased comparison among higher education institutions, the analyzed texts demonstrate the ways that rankers' narration of competition bring the nation state into being as a container for these institutions, personified with affective sensibilities, such as potential or desire to not fall behind. By utilizing an affective lens to, 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 to examine how the global is imagined and enacted in higher education, we revealed the multiple ways that the nation state category comes into being to interpret 
assess the value of, and direct connections and mobilities enacted through so-called global practices, and indeed shapes the very purpose and direction of those activities. In doing so, we explore how our impulses to move and connect through global higher education are not value or geographically neutral. Yet given the preeminence of methodological nationalism, what ostensibly might be a universal social good, that is global education and research dedicating to address, dedicated to addressing shared problems, often reproduces epistemological or ontological hierarchies mediated by nation state categories. To overcome meth methodological nationalism in practice, we need to interrogate our effective attachments to particular categories and contemplate how we might redirect our desires otherwise. The affect lens utilized here highlights the challenges that detaching from the nation state is not simply a rational or material exercise, but involves reimagining how we understand ourselves within and enact global education processes. Therefore, to move beyond methodological nationalism is not simply a discursive exercise like we're engaging in discussion today, but requires an ontological shift in how we are together in this, this enterprise. So thank you all very much. Well, thank you all, thank you all three. Uh, I mean, that was really profoundly interesting and, uh, and in different ways in each case. Uh, I mean, I think that, um, that, you know, many of us are very interested in Adam's argument about detaching ourselves from the nation state and finding ways to do that and how difficult it is, you know, to do that thoroughly um, I mean, India is a really good example. Uh, you know, it was that famous statement by um, by Anderson? You know, that the nation state is an imagined community, but it's so normatively powerful. And in a country like India, which where regional identity is so strong, and where universal thinking is so prevalent as well, uh, nonetheless, you've got this very busy nation state building itself at the expense of many of its citizens, in a, in a very vigorous way in this present period. Uh, although things have come unstuck in the pandemic, haven't they? It hasn't looked after its people very well. Um, Lisa's uh, presentation, I think, showed us how politicised and regulated, you know, higher education and science are becoming. Um, and this is something, I think, a big theme of the last two years or so, and particularly the, the, the you know, occasioned by the US-China imbroglio in relation to technology and science and student flows. But, but more generally, uh, we're seeing the state asserting itself, managing populations in higher education to an, a more in, in intensive extent than before. And it's going to be difficult, I think, to prise loose the hand of the state from this sector, which up to now has regulated itself pretty well uh, and, and developed remarkably, really, when you consider that it is a creature of the nation state still in many ways. Um, and of course, Emma's presentation really opened up the issues for us. I'm going to ask a question. We've got um, Diana Laurelard and Carolina Guzman is two formidable um, questioners coming up, uh, but I might ask the first one, uh, Emma, perhaps of you. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, to see the two themes that you outlined and the conjunction between them and the potential for understanding a relationship between them. The two themes, of course, are China, uh, the new presence in geopolitics, suddenly China, almost the equal of America, and with its own agenda, its own kind of what a, a desire to reconstruct the global uh, in its way according to its rules um and how that's causing all kinds of ructions in all kinds of ways and it's not going to go away china's too big to, to to be reduced back to where it was um and so you know there's there's all of that and that will play out for the rest of our lives but at the same time you've got this remarkable upsurge of of decoloniality and and um, anti-racism all over the world going on, especially in the West, um, and especially in English-speaking countries, but not only there. Um, so, I mean, the question that this poses, I think, is: is there a relationship, you know, between the East-West dynamic and the North-South dynamic that we're seeing? You know, is there a relationship between the rise of China and the destabilization of hegemony, Anglo-American hegemony, particularly the white supremacy, if you like? Of the Anglo-American neo neo empire, and um, and 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 the right and Black Lives Matter and Indigenous Lives Matter and you know even Palestine Lives Matter you know and the change in the Palestine Israel debate in the U.S. is another sign of a big you know how strong these shifts really are. Is there a relationship between East West dynamic and North South dynamic, and what is it? Do you want me to take that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what a fabulous question. Um, and um, 
I'm not one of these people who can think immediately rapidly on, on the spot. And it's, I think, a pretty profound question that you're asking, because what you're basically asking is about global power relations and how those are working. I think what I would say, in, you know, in a, a quick and dirty initial response to that is um, when we think particularly about, you, you sort of put it under the label of decoloniality, which I think I feel OK about, we have to remember that this isn't new. This isn't suddenly mm. something that's happening simply because in 2020, Black Lives Matter movements um, came to the forefront of our attention. And here I would draw you know, our, our attention also to our linguistic capacity. So you know, we're running this seminar in the English language, for example. So a lot of what we hear um, does relate a lot to in which language we are able to receive and process that information. So I think you know, that there are plenty of people in the room here who know and have been involved with uh, social justice uh, movements um, and these really important dynamics for years and years and years and who you know sit and feel frustrated that it's only because something hit the newspaper or some particular event hit the papers it, you know a year ago that actually everybody's talking about it it's, it's a cause of celebration that we are now bringing these agendas up um, but it's also a cause you know in Canada for example for ongoing frustration some people express surprise at the discovery of these uh you know the, the, this awful um, gravesite recently, but people who've been tracking these issues for a while know that there's nothing surprising about this. There's nothing surprising about Canadian government's actions or inactions towards the Indigenous peoples on the land that it has colonised. So, is there a relationship between you know what we're seeing with recent shifts with China? Well, I don't know whether we're thinking about correlation, causation, or something else. Um, so, I think you know that that's. But I'd love to explore that question further. I'm also thinking about sites where we see the drive towards decoloniality, which doesn't come necessarily out of global north, global west, whatever uh, you want to conceptualize the world, but out of places where there's there's perhaps even more of a pressing need for it. Um, so I think actually, rather than asking me, it would be appropriate to turn more to scholars and researchers and thinkers who are in the places where the struggle for decoloniality is really at the forefront um, and put that question in that direction. So I'm gonna uh, stop there because I, I can see there's other questions coming in, but yeah, thank you. That's, that's such a thought provoking question. I love it. And thanks Emma. Uh, and uh, let me invite um, Hannah if she wants to join the conversation you know, with the panelists, because um, I know you've been an important part of, of setting up the webinar today and the thinking behind it. Um, now, I'd like to bring in uh, Carolina Guzman first, and then I'll follow with Ron Barnett. Carolina. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Carolina Guzman, and um, I am in Chile, Universidad de Tarapacá in Chile. Um, this is a very interesting seminar. I think it's, it's a very complex matter. And um, I was wondering about more concrete implications for institutional policies or teaching practices, research uh, policies, and concrete, concrete actions that can be put into practice by universities in order to address um, new, the new geopolitics of higher education. So when we think about the new geopolitics, my 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 main concern is that we need to think about new roles of universities. Thank you very much. Who would like that one? Well, anyone can answer, I guess. By the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I might just jump in, uh, jump in and, uh, yeah. oh, and then I'll let Lisa, because Lisa probably. Um, your paper actually deals with this a lot, but just from the framing of the overall special issue, I could say that's that's a really good question. Um, and definitely, I think there's like a step between your question and and I guess what we're kind of trying to discover, which is a, a reckoning that institutions have a geopolitical role, right? So that's number one is kind of to recognize that. Uh, and then I think the next step would be to ask, okay, now what do we do? And I think that's where Lisa's conclusion was going, um, a little bit of understanding uh, what the university uh, can do with this understanding that it does play an important role uh, in power and, and world politics. Um, Lisa, do you want to pick up on that from the Canadian uh, example? Sure. Um, yeah, I can just comment that, for example, in the paper, I do focus a 
thought on the specifics of the Canadian policy context. And if you wanted to, for example, um, make the reporting system more clear to students so they have more just simply knowledge that they're being reported, that's one step that could be taken. Or you could um, adjust that the fact that it is being reported. So for example, institutions could speak back and say, well, why do we have to do this role? Or that's one thing because there's a lot of issues in the fine grained policy that students are being reported incorrectly. There's no opportunity to take a leave of absence, et cetera. So there's lots of work for institutions to do that to reduce the harm. And then I guess in another level, it's like, do how is um, higher ed participating in surveillance more generally? Are they recognizing that this is happening? Um, given that it is an issue and we know that with COVID, this is just the surveillance um, you can see it playing out in institutions about vaccine um, data. Like it's again, not that surveillance is inherently bad, but what are the, the issues down the line? And then I think what the paper then gestures towards is to even a bigger level, which is that um, how sustainable is it in the long term that the state would be the primary um, arbiter of rights. <laughs> um, it's a very powerful institution, but is that ultimately where we're going or, we'll, or what's right, I guess? So I see kind of three levels and the practical one, there's lots to do, but I didn't mention it too much here um, because it was so Canada specific. Thanks, Lisa, uh, and, and thanks, Hannah. Um, I'd like to invite our next three questioners together. We're running out of time, after, you know, there's, there's not, much left and uh, uh, but we've got you know good questions coming through and I don't want to miss them either so I want to give you the chance to reply panel so we'll bring in Ron Barnett, David Mills and David Law together and then hand over to the panel and we might have time for one more round of questions after that hopefully so try to keep it succinct everyone so Ron is first Ron Thanks, Simon. I'll try and be succinct. There's a growing philosophical literature on the issue of corporate agency. And given the wonderful three uh, sessions we've, uh, presentations we've had today, which for me have illustrated increasing fluidity in globalization, the question arises for me as to whether universities have more or less agency to express their possibilities for change. Thanks, Ron. Uh, David Mills. So yeah, great, great presentations. I love that they speak to each other in interesting ways. I mean, my initial question was around the, the limits of a word like geopolitics because of its histories within IR. And I mean, obviously we're all trapped within the languages as, as Emma pointed out. So I'm gonna ask a quick follow-up question to Lisa. You, you hinted at disinvestment as the way out of this, which is a very, quite an interesting question as to whether um, you're imagining a world beyond universities. So I want you to respond to that. And the third question in this bracket from David Law. Thank you. Um, I was reminded powerfully of the orthodox Marxist position uh, as the speakers were speaking that the working class has no country. Um, and then from that, I was starting to think about um, how do we actually understand the nation state in the context of the development of international higher education? It does seem to me that uh, even though it is a problematic concept for all sorts of reasons, uh, it really has to be uh, figured into our analysis because it's such an important economic agency. And in terms of the way in which international higher education is moving, I'm thinking in particular of, of China, but not only of China, uh, that it really must be fundamental to the an analysis of how the international system is changing. So that's a comment really rather than a question. Thanks, that's three useful contributions. Uh, who would like to respond? Let me start and then see whether mm. Adam um, wants to come back in, particularly on David Law's question, although all, all three questions and the ones I can see in the chat um, are really wonderful questions. And again, you know, like the engagement with this topic, I think there is something about the word in English, at least geopolitics, that, that draws people in. But it also, um, and you know, this is what Hannah and I have seen in looking at the literature, but it also pushes people in, in directions that we think perhaps aren't necessarily as fruitful as the ones that we're trying to kind of explore. And so that's why I think that, that some of the, the theory, theoretical side of the work that we're doing could be quite helpful, or we hope it would be helpful um, in studies of higher education. In response to Ron's, you know, rather wonderful question about increasing fluidity and globalization, 
I think from where I sit, there's both more and less space for higher education institutions to be agentic, which is the kind of response that I hope you would expect from, because I, you know, I think in certain ways we see spaces opening um, and we see prospects and, you know, Ron, you know, my work and the work that you've been doing with me and UNESCO, we're talking about, you know, how could higher education institutions take more global actorhood? You know, we have 20,000 or something universities and goodness knows how many colleges, institutes and other forms of higher education institution around the world. There's definitely space for them to come together in ways or through forums that already exist in ways that they do at the moment. That said, with regulation of the kind that Lisa's talked about, we see less space uh, to be agentic and more kind of uh, standardization through other um, things like that Rajni Naidu, for example, talks about, you know, the competition fetish and how rankings kind of brings to this homogenization. So I, I want to give the floor to both Adam and Lisa. So let me let me finish my brief remarks at that point. Sure, I'll jump in there. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. It's been tremendous to be involved. Um, sure, yeah. So I'll, I'll echo Emma's optimism. It's, I, I hope I hope so. I hope that higher education institutions might be a powerful actor for change. But um, and if we look at the alternatives, corporations and governments, they haven't been doing a great job reacting to the challenges that that faces collectively as societies. You know, look look at ha what happened with with COVID and the nation state re reacting along nation state lines has, has put us in worse cir circumstances. Um, so, but I agree with you, David. I, I think that the nation state is a powerful economic actor in that you know, domestically in the U.S. right now, we're, we have, we're, we're incoherent without under, understanding ourselves without, a, without an international enemy. And the fact that like, I'm excited about this new, new bill that's coming through, through the Senate to invest a whole bunch of money in the National Science Foundation because we're going to get some more money in higher education. But I mean, that makes it even more difficult for higher education to separate itself from the state because we're so reliant on the state itself to, to, to make ourselves viable. So we need to beat up on China in, debt in order to get our NSF money so we can keep ourselves sustained. So it's while, while I'm hopeful that the state can you know transcend national boundaries in order to, to address, uh, so sorry, I'm hoping that uh, that universities might transcend national boundaries to be able to 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 push for collective social good. I, I'm 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 you know I'm a little apprehensive because of the current you know state that we we, we live in in terms of higher education's reliant on, reliance on 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 federal federal money federal policies to, to even exist or to even understand themselves. Um, I guess I could just offer yep. very briefly in uh, in response to the. Um, David Mills' question, I believe, um, about outside the, the the academy and what's beyond that. I mean, I I have a lot of uh, internal struggle about the about higher education. I guess I would fit into the critical higher education category, critical university studies, and there's a lot of conversation about disinvesting from higher education, and yet most of us are very invested in higher education to make that argument. So it's a double-edged sword. Um, I do, I mean, my supervisors um, have a collective called Gesturing Towards Decolonial Futures, if anyone's interested. And um, I find it to be um, very useful in terms of generating possible futures in the sense that um, it doesn't operate with authorship. It doesn't um, look for validation from the institution, although it kind of hospices the institution is the way that it's put that it's a dying institution, the state is dying, but um, we can let it go out gracefully and use the resources as it's going, <laughs> hacking the institution as it's dying. Um, again, I, I, I am torn. I'm very, um, I still want to defend the role of higher education as the conscience for society and um, use those state-based resources. Um, but these are the issues that I'm struggling with. So uh, yeah, I look forward to future conversations. Thanks. That's thank, thank, thank you all three for those responses. I think we've got time to bring in our last two questions and then uh, and then maybe have a, have a, a very quick final round. Um, we usually can spill the webinar to about five past three before we lose too many people and we shut down at that point usually. So Priya uh, Pujari and Vafa uh, Gazimova, can you, you come in first, Priya? Uh, thank you so much, Simon, for calling us in. Thank you so much uh, for all the excellent presentations. So my question is, uh, 
If you see today, the new geopolitics of international higher education is also characterized by the presence, by a regional presence. So we are also seeing that there are new initiatives at regional level that's also spearheading what we call as the regionalization of higher education. So my question to mainly to Emma is, are we witnessing some new forms of competition that's characterized at the regional level? Could this region be the new nexus of competition in international higher education? Thank you very much. And Varfa. Hello, Varfa. I just had some uh, chat conversation with Varfa, so she's there. And her question was, let me quickly go back to it. It's a lot in the chat today. Do you think that the changing global geopolitics can pose any threats to academic freedom to HEIs in the European context? So there's two questions and feel free to answer them, uh, panel and, and ha Hannah, if you wish. I wonder and if we could this, I think yeah, I wonder... this is your final summing up as well, if you, if you need that. And I might uh, maybe say something about the regional uh, the regionalization question mm -hmm. uh, briefly. Um, definitely, um, the answer is yes, uh, for sure. Uh, and even one of the articles in the special issue uh, deals with the regional university as kind of the new normality. So absolutely, uh, we do see uh, you know regional competition more and more. Um, and different regions coming up and higher education uh, place there. And one thing that I just want to mention here is that um, as part of the special issue, kind of our idea was to um, bring in different uh, scales and understandings of this geopolitics. So we could have had a special issue probably on, on regional higher education. Um, and it is definitely part of the, of the themes that we engage with, along with you know, different scales, um, like as Emma mentioned uh, in, in her opening of the presentation. So definitely the answer is yes. And we hope to engage in, in that and how it relates to other territorial and non-territorial uh, issues that come up uh, in the new geopolitics of higher education. I, I think I was going to mention the article there and say, you know, that, that this is definitely at a level I think that we need to pay more attention to. And you mentioned the regional university, right? That I think perhaps even extends the, the question beyond, you know, different regions. I, I mean, I don't think regions set out to be in competition with one another, but I think if you see, if you can start to think of regions and regional groupings as a new or emerging strengthening actor, then the question about competition, I think naturally seems to follow um, from that. In terms of our first question, I was going to see whether uh, colleagues wanted to extend that beyond the European context and, and perhaps say anything about it from different uh, positions as well. Um, let, let's let's see on that. Adam or Lisa, I don't know whether you want to add anything either to the two questions or just um, mm. in, in summary to anything else that's come through. We're good. Thank you. Both. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot more to be said, but I think we're all quite yes. conscious that it can't be said really in the next ninety seconds or so. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, time, as usual, you know, is, the, is will beat us. But um, there's been tremendous enthusiasm in the chat about this uh, this webinar, and uh, I want to sincerely thank uh, Emma Sabzaliva, uh, Lisa Brunner, and Adam Grimm and Hannah Moskovitz for setting this up, and and look out for globalization societies and education special issue on the new geopolitics of higher education. GSE, as we call it, is a very innovative and interesting theory-laden journal with lots of things to say about contemporary issues. Really good journal, and uh, I strongly recommend it to everyone who's not currently using it. Um, not everything happens in the highest impact journals. Often the medium impact journals carry the best conversations. British Journal of Sociology of Ed's another one, for example, uh, like that, like GSE. Um, it's been a really good webinar, and I think that we welcome all, all of you and any of you back again on our webinar program in future. We're very interested, and I think the audience has shown today, it's very interested in the um, topic which you've addressed and the range of things that you brought to bear on it, all of them seem re relevant and, uh, and useful and important and contemporary. So thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, our, our next uh, webinar on Thursday takes us to Japan where, um, and I'm just looking for the details here, Futao Huang and Lilin Chen will be speaking about how do international faculty at Japanese universities view their integration. So Japan has more openness than sometimes it gets credit for. 
And there's more migration into Japan, although it's not officially acknowledged exactly by uh, by, by the Japanese government. It's quite important demographically. And uh, one of the routes into Japan as a migrant is through higher education. Uh, and one of the routes into higher education is employment as international faculty working in Japan. There are barriers and obstacles, but it does happen in significant numbers. But in this very, very bordered society where national identity and culture is so strong, international faculty face all kinds of challenges and issues as well. Difficult to be mul multiple in your identity in Japan. You know, it's, you kind of got to jump one way or the other a bit. Um, but tremendously exciting country to live and work in as well. And, uh, you know, where many of the things we do are carried to the, you know, to a very high level of, uh, of, of development. Um, so come, come along again in two days time, moving from the general geo topic of the geopolitics of higher education to the specific side of Japan. Um, thank you again to, to uh, Emma, uh, Hannah, Adam and Lisa and come back again, all of you, uh, and bye for now.